to split this kind of hair, uh, to have this kind of focus, uh, to sit around a table and, and take two papers um, which have split a hair between two people who agree on almost everything important, I think, uh, and to, you know, to, to do that, uh, that's been the wonderful thing about this, um, this thing that you arranged, Andy. Uh, it seems like the disagreement here uh, had to do with the way I spoke about reason uh, and something about calling reason um, appearance. And so uh, I thought perhaps uh, uh, if I change that, and David's not here, David? No. no. Oh, okay. Uh, well, it occurred to me, and I don't know whether it was Sarah who came up with this or I came up with it or it emerged out of a conversation we had when we were walking here. But perhaps if we don't do appearance, if I said just reason, reason some that just, would that help, Jay? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> At the, you, know, you have reason, you have samvritti, and everything is conventional, and it's all working fine, and, uh, and, and we can split these hairs, and we can have these conversations, and it's just reason. Mm. The first thing I guess I'd want to reflect on is that many people yesterday very helpfully called attention to the role of Madhyamaka in practice and the transformative role of Madhyamaka and the importance of trying to understand Madhyamaka as um, a transformative practice. And I think that's really important. Um, and I'm very grateful to people for calling attention to that, um, especially Connie and Karen and Slava, Mario in, in, in various ways. Um, because it's really easy for people to listen to um, egghead philosophers talk about Madhyamaka and arguments and analysis and to think that um, practice is somehow being left behind. Um, and then I think that it's always important for us to remember that to say that this is philosophy and this is practice is dualistic. Um, only when you see that philosophy is a practice and the practice is aimed at philosophical insight do you transcend that and enter the Dharma door of non-duality. That's someplace in the Vimalakirti Nadesha Sutra or other. Um, anyway, so I really am I'm very grateful for that emphasis and I'm going to want to talk a little bit about that today and how that might inflect um, some of the remarks that Sandy and I each made yesterday, taking, taking that seriously. I'm going to start there, but I'm going to tell you where I'm going to go, because George um, left me with a charge yesterday. George accuses me of being a slime ball and kind of trying to weasel Magician. my way. Excuse me? Magician was his word. I didn't use slime ball. <laughs> Magician. I'll do Magician. Magician. Um, given that that's an epithet with which Sandy tars himself, <laughs> That's even worse. <laughs> but, um, but, but what he's accusing me of is, is, is sort of keeping, uh, is running a shell game in my analysis of Nagarjuna. And he has challenged me to come clean to explain what I mean in various places in my work. Not in this paper that we're, we've been talking about here, but for instance, in my commentary to Mulla Majamaka Karaka and in some of my papers on Vigilahavya Vartani, when I really do claim to be endorsing um, Nagarjuna's own claim to be uh, rejecting all views and to be thesisless. And I think that all of that connects deeply with the idea of Madhyamaka as practice. And so I want to talk, I want to get there and to explain how I get there and why, um, to go egghead again, dialetheism <laughs> helps you understand um, all of that and why that's important. But also how that, um, reveals, and this comes back to insights that Mario um, forced on us yesterday, the dialectical character of the Madhyamaka project. I think it's important for us to understand the dialectical and the pragmatic character of the Madhyamaka project. So I'm, I'm going to go there as well. And as we'll see, dialetheism also can allow us to solve some other profound problems 
that arose around this table. Um, so um, let me kind of start there. As I said, I think that far too much is made of the duality of philosophy and practice. Um, to be sure, there are some people who would say that approaching what Nagarjuna does as just an abstract philosophical um, system neglects its transformative capacity. But as I indicated in my question to Connie the other day, my own view is, and this just comes maybe from the fact that I've done philosophy too long or that it's the only thing I know how to do, but that philosophy itself is transformative. And that's not necessarily a, just a Buddhist insight, right? I mean, that's an insight that runs through the Western tradition um, as well. I mean, after all, those of you who have read the Nicomachean Ethics will remember that Aristotle remarks, the task of ethics is not to learn what is good, but to become good. Um, that he intends even that book to be transformative. And Sextus, of course, my, my great hero, talks incessantly about the transformative um, purpose of, of the dialectic. So I, I think that that's an important thing for us to see to the extent that we distance ourselves from the texts and try to treat the texts as things that have nothing particular to do with us. Then we are um, committing the methodological error against which Sandy properly warns us, and that is to use a hermeneutic, that, a hermeneutic approach that starts out by denying what the text is all about. Um, and if you do that, then there's just something fundamentally misguided, right? So I first want to kind of try to put that, that duality aside. And for Nagarjuna, um, a lot of the um, soteriological rubber hits the marga um, when we get to the question um, at the end of Mula Majamika Karika, um, when Nagarjuna prostrates to Gautama, the best of all teachers who taught the true doctrine that leads to the relinquishing of all views. Now, as many people around here know, um, certain um, Tibetan heroes of mine um, destroy that verse pretty regularly by inserting the, the word false in there and try to really tame Nagarjuna. As Kamto Rinpoche said to me once in conversation, I think there is a word in Sanskrit for false, and I think Nagarjuna knew it, and that if he meant to say all false views, he would have been able to write that. Um, and I, I think that that's, that's dead right. I think that trying to tame Nagarjuna that way is very dangerous. That, but thinking about that verse, um, takes us back to um, a verse that takes us to a story, a Chandrakirti story. And so I was really happy that Karen was talking about Chandrakirti stories. And it takes us back to the verse in, in chapter 15 um, about for whomever, uh, emptiness itself is a relinquishing of all views, for whomever, for whomever yeah. emptiness becomes a view, that person's hopeless. And Chandrakirti tells a great story in Sikh Sel and Prasanapada in commenting on that verse. And it's my favorite Chandrakirti story, though it may get dislodged if I start reading the Chandrakirti Katika seriously. But anyway, it's so far my favorite. And many of you know the story, so I'll, I'll tell it really fast. Um, you go into a shop, and it's probably like, you know, I don't know, in Moldova or someplace, because there's nothing on the shelves. <laughs> and, um, you, and you go to the shopkeeper, and you say, I want to buy something. And the shopkeeper says, I have nothing to sell. And you say, fine, I'll have some of that. Um, if, and Sean Vickerty says, if that's what you do, what kind of stuff are you going to get hold of? Absolutely nothing. And that's what Sean Vickerty has in mind by taking emptiness as a view, by taking it as something you can get a hold of. And I think that is an apt, a brilliant story and a brilliant gloss on what Nagarjuna is doing in that verse and then what he does at the end. Um, and so here's what I mean by that and why I think it takes us to a kind of dialectical reading of Mula Majamika Karika and why we need to um, bring in some of the tools of, of dialectic logic if we want to make sense of this as anything other than a magic trick. Because, um, I mean, one of the places where Sandy and I probably still disagree is I still think of magician as a pejorative term. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's a small disagreement, by the way. That's a small disagreement. <laughs> But I like um, the story, the Chandra story. It's a good story. Very good story. <laughs> um, so, what's going on here? When we think about um, when we think about emptiness, and, and again, for a lot of people around this table, it's a totally old hat. You can space out, but it's at least the stuff that I meditate on a lot. 
Um, when we think about emptiness, we're thinking about emptiness as um, a complete negation. And what is it the negation of? Um, we, we focus on what that object of negation is, and the, neg the object of negation is inherent existence. It's not conventional phenomena, it's not the world, um, it's, you know, it's inherent existence. And so I often translate that in English essence. You might like prefer substance, or I mean, it's, it's no notoriously trying to translate from Hava or Rangshin is a pain in the ass, but think of it for right now as essence. The, um, the danger against which Nagarjuna and Chandrakirti are warning us in that verse and then at the end of the text. And this is the same issue that's being raised in Vigahavya Vartani in a slightly different register. So I'm going to just focus on Mulama Jamaka Karika right now, and let, because we only have 15 minutes and I've probably already spent it, and let you apply this mutatis mutandis to the Vigahavya Vartani discussion. Um, what Nagarjuna is urging is what you don't want to do is to say, Emptiness is actually the essence of things. It wasn't this, it wasn't that, it wasn't what this person said, it wasn't what that person. Instead, the essence of things is emptiness. And so one way of understanding that, a very deep way of understanding that, it's a way that connects Nagarjuna um, both to Sextus, and of course the other great connection is that Chandrakirti and Sextus then use the same metaphor. They use the laxative metaphor, right? which comes up in Sextus and in Chandrakirti, which is so weird, right? <laughs> um, it gets Tom Machiavelli going, right? Um, so anyway, um, for both of them, and this connects to Heidegger very directly, what Nagarjuna is really on about in Mola Majamaka Karika, among a hundred other things, is a critique of what we would call the project of fundamental ontology. Um, that is the project of trying to give an account of the fundamental nature of reality, of being. Um, and Nagarjuna's very deep insight that motivates all of Mola Majamaka Karika, as far as I'm concerned, is that the project of fundamental ontology is fundamentally misguided. The whole idea that there is a fundamental nature of reality is fundamentally erroneous. That's why emptiness is such a powerful negation. It's the denial that there can be a fundamental nature of reality. And that's why the temptation is so much to say, okay, now we know what the fundamental reality, nature of reality is, it's emptiness, and now you've gone back into fundamental ontology. So what Nagarjuna is saying is, don't take me as doing philosophy at the same level as my um, opponents. There's a dialectical move. I'm rejecting that level of metaphysical analysis. And you won't want, if you take my rejection and squash it down to that level of metaphysical analysis and say that's what it is, then you've mistaken the dialectical character of my project. So at the end of um, Mola Majamaka Karika, when the guardian that prostrates to Gautama, the best of all teachers who taught the true doctrine, no, he doesn't say there's no doctrine, <coughs> that uh, you know, is right there, right? That led to the um, relinquishing of all views, of all drishti, of all tawa. What he means is all views about the fundamental nature of reality, right? Those are the ones that are gone. Emptiness isn't meant to be one of those. If emptiness is a view about the fundamental nature of reality, get rid of that too. But you already should have got rid of it a few chapters ago. But you might still have some in your pocket, so empty your pockets right now, you're landing. Um, so, there is a paradox nonetheless, um, because now, we find ourselves, you know, as it were, at the limits of thought. Um, because if you then ask yourself, so, what is the fundamental nature of reality, Nagarjuna? Um, Nagarjuna does have an account of what ultimate truth is. That's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, he tells us what ultimate truth is. It's emptiness. It's the emptiness of there being any essence or anything like that. Mark Sideritz, of course, has put this very famously in his wonderful quip, the ultimate truth is that there is no ultimate truth. Um, and there's ways to read that. There's the way Mark reads it, which tames his own remark, and there's the way I prefer to read it, which leaves it untamed and wild. Um, but still, when you are doing, when you're rejecting fundamental ontology, the enterprise you're doing is fundamental ontology, right? I mean, this is the sort of the, the deep paradox at the limit. When we say that the nature of things is that they have no nature, we have at the same time denied that they've had a nature and asserted that they've had a nature. Now, this kind of paradox um, 
is the kind of paradox that um, strikes fear into the hearts of those who grasp for consistency. And, you know, it, one of the funny things is that we see in so much um, Madhyamaka literature um, talking about how terrifying and fearful the Madhyamaka doctrine is and how people, and you kind of wonder how can people be scared of philosophy, right? It doesn't do anything, it just sort of sits there on dusty shelves, right? But this is philosophy that actually scares people because a lot of people care about consistency. And it's worth pointing out that this kind of terror of the inconsistent is not just something that you find in India, right? You find it in the United States of America as well. Um, so that when um, those of us from um, the antipodes um, argue that there are contradictions that are true and point out that, for instance, if you speak a language that's got a truth predicate in it, anybody here speak a language with a truth predicate in it? Raise your hands. What did Tarski prove about your language? He proved that if your language contains a truth predicate, it's inconsistent because you are committed to the existence of a liar sentence. This sentence is false, and, this set, and if that sentence is false, then it's true. And if it's true, if and only if it's false, then it's both true and false. You can escape that dilemma. You can escape it by claiming that the word is true doesn't exist in English. But you'd have to endorse the truth of your claim, and now you're back in the soup, right? So um, to the extent that you're willing to tolerate contradictions and to tolerate a logic that allows you to tolerate contradictions, then we can make serious sense of Nagarjuna really seriously asserting that he rejects all views, really seriously asserting that he has no pratijna. Because these, the fact that these paradoxes <coughs> arise is no surprise. They arise at the same place where Tarski's paradox, where the liar paradox arises. They arise at the same place where the Barali Forti paradox arises. They arise at the same place where the Marimanov paradox arises. They arrive at all of these places where we reach the limits of our thought and our expression. And emptiness, we know, even we say this in Tibetan, right? It's the very limit of analysis. When we reach the limits, we expect to find paradoxes. And indeed, what's so profound about Nagarjuna, as far as I'm concerned, um, and I think this is a place where Sandy and I agree very deeply, even if we might disagree about the details. The most profound thing about Nagarjuna's Madhyamaka is that he was the first person in the history of world philosophy to take seriously the fact that reality is fundamentally paradoxical, fundamentally contradictory. What I admire about Nagarjuna is that he arrived at that in a rationally compelling way that shows that you think your way into that paradox. You don't just kind of take drugs or something, right? Um, you don't kind of cause yourself to believe in that paradox. You think your way into that paradox. And I think the courage that Nagarjuna demonstrated in following thought right into the transconsistent um, is the kind of enormous philosophical courage that so many other philosophers including, say, Jay Rinpoche, um, who I admire so much in so many other ways, um, didn't have. Um, that they felt they had to tame it and make it um, somehow come out consistent. And when it comes out consistent, it just plain comes out boring. So I don't see magic or conjuring here, and I don't even see this as a <laughs> slimy approach. Um, I, I just see it as trying to take very seriously Nagarjuna's insistence um, on exactly what he says, and taking very seriously the fact that when you take it seriously, it's inconsistent, it's contradictory, but nonetheless, it's profoundly true. Um, and so, you know, often when we look at the history of Buddhist philosophy, especially after Madhyamaka, we see paradox and contradiction <coughs> arising in so many contexts. And very often, people's temptation is to say, OK, let's resolve the paradox. Let's disambiguate. Let's parameterize. Let's see it as metaphorical. I think that just takes all the transformative power away from it. If this is about transformation, it's about leading us. It's about the fundamental transformation that forces us to let go of that subtle grasping um, to consistency. And I think that's part of the transformative power of what Nagarjuna is doing, and you can't appreciate that if you tame that last shloka or if you tame Vigraha Vyavartani. These have to be left in the wild.